photograph taken more than 50 years ago was the home of Juana Briones. This house, built in 1847, shown in this 1903 photograph, is located on a beautiful knoll off Arastadero Road in Palo Alto, very close to the border of Los Altos Hills. The Juana Briones adobe is included in the city of Palo Alto's historic inventory and now be, may be in danger of demolition by its current owner. Hello, I'm Nan Geschke, your host of the Los Altos History Show. Tonight we have as our guest Jean McDonald of the Juana Briones Heritage Foundation. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. It's mm -hmm. our special pleasure to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Jean, along with many others, have been responsible for recognizing the life and work of Juana Briones. And tonight we hope to talk about Juana Briones, her life and accomplishments, as well as the significance of one of her residences which is located in our local area. And <clears throat> before we start talking about uh, her adobe, which we had shown some photographs earlier uh, mm -hmm. as we rolled into the show, we wanted to know what really got you interested in the first place, Jean, in the life of, of Juana Briones. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a newspaper article one day. I had been, um, I had quit my day job in order to start the Women's Heritage Museum and the board decided that we should do public programs to teach the world about women's history as we work toward founding the museum. So one day I saw an article in the paper about uh, a house, a woman named Marjorie Eaton had died, she was quite mm -hmm. a, a noted local artist and uh, actress and um, her niece uh, who was, would be the third generation of that family to live in the house, was hoping to be able to buy, buy it. So the article told about Juana Briones and uh, the family and a whole lot of background material. I had never heard anything about that, but I wrote a letter to Susan Berthium and I said, um, maybe something could be done. Maybe we could uh, be, uh, take some interest in it. I don't know, but could we explore it? So she called me and I went to see her and the upshot of that was that we uh, negotiated a contract. This took quite a while mm -hmm. to do, but it was a three-way contract under the State Mills Act and um, it was signed by the City of Palo Alto, the Women's Heritage Museum and the owner. The city got preservation of a very unique and important historic resource. The owner got a reduction in property taxes, and the Women's Heritage Museum got the opportunity to take the public into the house 20 days a year, which oh. was became a, quite a, a thing. We trained docents, we took in school groups, we had uh, regular monthly tours, so it was a, a wonderful uh, opportunity for us. And a wonderful resource for the community yes. as well. Yes. So well, more than just our community, there yeah. really it's a, a California resource. It's really a national. Uh, so you did a lot of research about the life of Juana Briones. Well, that was then the first one of the first the things thing. we had to begin to verify the things that had been said, and we found a real uh, trove of information. Marvelous. Uh, resources about this woman, about the house over the years, in, and we came to, in, uh, to interpret it with continuity. It was an example of the continuity of California history from the Indians right to the present day. And that had, I thought that was extremely important. So you don't sort of separate out the Hispanic people as uh, different from us. We were all part of the same history. Same That's history. the way we did it. Yeah. 
So, um, first of all, I, I think we should probably put Juana Brionis in a time period. When was she born? She was born in 1802. And, and what uh, was her early life like? Well, her, her father was uh, Marcos Briones. He was the son of Vicente uh, Briones and was with his father. He was a, a teenager with his father at Monterey. They were both soldiers. They were Spaniards. They had come up from Mexico when Mexico was part of the Spanish Empire. And her mother, Isadora Tapia, was a child, three or four years old, coming with her family with the De Anza expedition, which came north in 1775, and that was the first group of settlers. In other words, it's the first time women came to California to, uh, to take up lives here, to build homes, to uh, build uh, ranches. So they were the pioneers. Huh? They were the pioneers of the, of, uh, uh, the Spanish Mexico. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but then she was born later. This was, this was 1775. Was the parents la ma married later. They were very young at that time. And, um, and Branciforte was a little agricultural community. The, um, the authorities had the realization that it was very difficult to feed people at the Presidio because you couldn't farm the land mm -hmm. up on the point of land um, at the Golden Gate. So they, they established this Branza Forte as an agricultural community, and that's where she was born. It didn't actually last very long for some reason. I'm not sure why. And, but that's now Santa Cruz. Oh. That's the town of Santa Cruz. So did she get married and have Well, you? then uh, the next we know about her was in 18, well, first of all, we do, there's a map of the San Francisco Presidio, and off the corner of the fort, the drawing of the fort, it shows a little dotted line, and along that line are two rectangles. One says the home of Marcos Briones, so that must have been where she was living as a, a mm -hmm. young, a girl in her adolescence, and the next house is Miramontes and that her sister married into the Miramontes family but uh, so she must have been living right near the Presidio in 1820 when she married Apolinario Miranda and they established a residence down the road a piece oh and uh, if you go there today you it's a wonderful place it's a lion street that runs right along the border of the San Francisco pr Presidio a wonderful spot so um, is that where she lived then with, with him when That's she, where they, they had eight children, and most of them were born when they lived there. And um, it was a, that was a, an amazing place. For one thing, one of the amazing, uh, wonderful things about Juana Briones is that she did not let anybody uh, take her land away from her, which if you know California history, that's what happened to most of the Hispanic people. They lost their property when the Americans came in. They didn't speak English. They didn't know the laws. It was a difficult uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So, but she did not. and. Um, uh, the Ojo, it was called the Ojo de Agua de Figueroa, in other words, the stream or the well of Figueroa, and that was right there uh, at the border of the Presidio. Well, today you can see a little indentation in that border. There are five beautiful buildings there. Uh, some of them, a couple of them are apartments, a couple are houses, but she ha stuck to her guns and verified that that was her land, took it to the Supreme Court of the United States and won. So now there's this indentation in the border of the Presidio. <laughs> <laughs> so I recommend uh, our listeners to go there. It's a wonderful place. Oh, that was, that's marvelous. Mm -hmm. and, and she but, also was something of, a, of an entrepreneur, I understand, too. Well, she was, she, they were farming there. Yes. And she had an orchard and uh, uh, was growing things and she had cattle and, uh, uh, it was a it was a working ranch, but uh, it was a fairly small property, and uh, she and her husband d simply did not get along. Uh, she was extremely ambitious. I mean that's proven by her later life, and she wanted the best for her children, and she really wasn't getting it there. She wasn't pleased with. Uh, he was a soldier and uh, was reported to the authorities a couple of times for uh, who knows what. But uh, anyway, it, it turned out that she applied to the bishop for a separation from him. Which was very unusual in those days, too, it wasn't was it? It was not done. No. It was simply not done. 
But I think one of the reasons she went to the trouble, I mean, she could have just moved down the road or something, mm -hmm. but I think that one of the reasons she went to the trouble of getting a, an official separation was so she could land, own land in her own name, because that's what she did subsequently. Mm -hmm. So um, why did she uh, move down to this area? Because she was very well established up in San Francisco. Well, the, one of the things, I, actually I had her at near the Presidio. Video. One of the things about that land, if, if you know the Presidio at all, it's, I it's do, very yes. barren. Yes. And it could not have been a terribly good place to raise uh, food. Food. And also, at one time, the authorities required that the ships uh, that came into the harbor, they were collecting hides and cat from the cattle mm -hmm. that grew on a thousand hills here. And um, so uh, when they came into the harbor, they had to, to anchor near the Presidio so that the soldiers could watch them. Sure. Well, there was a terrible storm once, and many of the ships were destroyed. And after that, the, the ship captain said, forget it, we're going to go over to this cove where our ships can be safe, which is what they did. Well, Juana moved her residence, and her husband apparently did not go with her, over to that cove. And there she sold milk, produce, uh, food. The people, the ship people were desperate for fresh food. Sure. I mean, you know that history yes, of, of course. Uh, horrible diseases because they didn't have the proper nourishment. So she sold food to the, uh, the ships that came in. And she could do it there and also it was a much better soil, a better place for growing things. And on one old map, uh, one of the earliest maps of San Francisco, it's called La Playa de Juana Briones, mm -hmm. the beach of Juana Briones. And, I and that's now North Beach. I understand she uh, had a special tea that she used well, to. That, uh, the Well, the first community, there were three residents in the Pueblo that was established. That was the first civil community. And they called, they named it Yerba Buena. That means good herb. Mm -hmm. And that was named for w the tea that Juana Briones made from this good herb that she collected on what's now Telegraph Hill. So everyone who came to San Francisco, to Yerba Buena, stopped at her house and she gave them this tea. Mm -hmm. So they named the community after it. Uh -huh. And you mm -hmm. said, uh, you know, and, and then she moved down here. To well, she lived there for quite some, she was uh, an original founder there. But you see, you have to realize that this was Spain. Mm -hmm. In 1822, which was just after her marriage, Mexico uh, got its independence. So there was a whole new regime once that happened. Spain had been very particular about keeping the ships out of, out of the harbor. Mm -hmm. They didn't want trade. And the people were really suffering. Uh, once Mexico uh, got independence, it owned California, and the ships were allowed to come and go, and they were allowed to trade with the people. Well, that made it advantageous to her to move over to the place where she could serve the ships. So she lived at Yerba Buena for a good uh, 10 or more years, mm -hmm. made her living there. And um, then, uh, as I think, <laughs> I just find it kind of amusing that yeah. uh, the town got too crowded for her. There were 50 <laughs> people living there. So uh, I think it was just too many people for her. But in any case, when the missions were secularized, uh, the land passed into the hands of the ranchers and some of the native people who had staffed the missions. So one of the ranches was La Purissima Concepcion, and that had been given by the uh, Santa Clara Mission to a family of Indians, Jose Gorgonio was his name, and uh, it was a 4,400 acre ranch that was one square league, it was Spanish measurement, and um, they sold it to Juana Briones for, I forget if it was three or four hundred dollars, I think it was three hundred dollars. She bought that 4,400 acre ranch, and they continued to live there. There was there were five or six Indian people living on the ranch when one person visited in, in 1847. Mm -hmm. And I understand, even though she probably was illiterate, she was very uh, tenacious about her real estate dealings. Well, I have a feeling that her uh, one of the stories I didn't tell is how she gave refuge to sailors. It, mm -hmm. it was an extremely uh, it was almost a vicious life aboard ship. And often sailors, they would see this California looked like a good place to live. They wanted to get away from the life of the sea. And she would um, protect them. In one case, they, she sent them over to her brother, Felipe, in the East Bay. 
and they worked there for on that on his ranch for a number of years until the ship left the harbor and then they were safe but um so that that was one of the uh the things she was noted for but i think in doing these kindnesses i think of her as a humanitarian yeah. doing these things for people she learned the ways of the world and she learned that you had to make sure about your ownership and um, so she always sought counsel very good people to advise her and she always had written documentation and uh, she was incredible she would have been a lawyer today I think yeah. um, she just was extremely cautious about those things so is that why you think it's important for people to know about Juana Briones I mean she was an entrepreneur and she certainly was a very independent woman for her time mm -hmm. but are, are there any other reasons why we should and she was a healer yeah. um, are there any other reasons for her well, she was the first female uh, that was really recognized in California history isn't that right well the other stories about women in the history that ha had been written were always little cute little love stories yeah. or uh, it was always something to do with uh, somebody's romance and Juana is a person who was extremely important in her own right. She was important, whether she had been a man or a woman, she was important. She left behind her this amazing house yes. in, uh, that's in Palo Alto, right on the edge of Los Altos Hills. And, or is it Los Altos there? I'm not sure. I think it's Los Altos Hills. Old Adobe Hills. Road, yeah. Yes. And um, one of the really stunning things about her is she must have been extremely charismatic because people were always writing about her. And so that history has a lot to do with people who write things down that you can remember. And a lot of people told about experiences. Stories Juana about Juana Briones. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, one of her things about being a, a doctor, I call her a doctor, she was a curandera, a person who knew medicine. And uh, she was a herbalist, and uh, that's a whole art in itself, uh, knowing the plants of your area. And undoubtedly, she learned a lot of that from the Indian people. But there were wonderful stories about her. One was that uh, the people in Bolinas were having a smallpox uh, epidemic, and they called her in to take care of them. And um, one of the things she did when she came was immediately she separated all the sick people from the well people. It was a pretty smart tactic. Mm -hmm. But her nephew, Pablo Briones, was uh, uh, asked if he could be her assistant at this time. And uh, so he helped her. And when it was over, he declared that he wanted to be a doctor. And she trained him. And I have seen his little medical certificate up in the collection of the Bolinas Historical Society. And it says uh, he was trained by Juana Briones. Oh, interesting. And uh, he was the doctor of, of Bolinas yeah. for 50 years. Well, I know that uh, we're going to be going on location to talk to some other people from your Heritage Foundation about mm -hmm. the adobe in, mm -hmm. uh, in Palo Alto. And I understand that it had been open uh, for tours, as you said, uh, previously, but it's no longer open. And, and that must be uh, uh, rather um, distressing to your organization, you know, to mm -hmm. not, not to have that. Um, yes. But um, we uh, are running out of time, believe, right. believe it or not, <laughs> Jean. But um, uh, we really appreciate you coming and talking to us about uh, the life of Juana Briones. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will look forward to uh, uh, talking with other members from your um, your Heritage Foundation about mm -hmm. about the house in Palo Alto and perhaps get some views um, from one of the members' homes up there, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, get some of uh, some other opinions about uh, about uh, what's what's happening with the home. Mm -hmm. So uh, please stay tuned uh, to uh, to to see to see uh, Water Briones' home, and uh, let's roll that tape now. We're here at the home of Meredith Phillips uh, uh, in, in, on Old Adobe Road. I'm talking with Gail Woolley, who is the uh, president of the Juana Briones Heritage Foundation. 
And in the background, we can see uh, the uh, Wanabrionis adobe, and we're hoping today, later on, to be able to go out and get some better shots of, of the adobe. But mm -hmm. it's appropriate that we're standing here, Gail, and talking about the adobe, because I know you've been very instrumental in getting the uh, Heritage Foundation going. And can you tell, tell us a little bit about uh, how that process has worked? Surely. The Heritage Foundation seeds were sown back in the fall of 1998 when the current owners of the house applied for a demolition permit to the city of Palo Alto. And the city uh, denied the permit. And so the owners then sued the city uh, in order to obtain a permit. That caused the neighbors, some of the neighbors and others of us concerned about that house uh, as a very important historic resource yes. to, to get together to try to do something. And so what did you do? <laughs> well, the first thing we did was to uh, lobby the city council and uh, then we decided we had better really form a formal group. And so we um, incorporated and we applied and received our tax exempt uh, status and since then we have been working very hard to increase the uh, support in the community for preserving this resource. Gail, how, how is your organization actually reaching out to the community to inform them about the house? Well, one of our most successful ways of doing this is through our website. Oh, wonderful. And the uh, website has both in Spanish and in English, which we think is very appropriate because after all, the, the history of this house really begins with the time when Spanish was the language in California. So we would invite people to uh, look at our website and learn about what we're doing that way. And the web address is on our screen right now. Beautiful, so perfect. Any, anybody who wants to, uh, to uh, search uh, the internet and find it, mm -hmm. it's there. And, and get in touch with us that way. Great, thanks. Thank you. We're here with the neighbor of uh, Meredith and also a neighbor of the Juana Brionis Adobe. Her name is Diane Master. And um, I'm just going to ask you, Diane, you know, why, why did you get involved? I mean, neighbors sometimes don't want to get involved. Why did you get involved? Um, I got involved because I grew up in a home where there was a real appreciation for history. Um, I grew up on the East Coast um, on Long Island in a town called Roslyn that was from the Revolutionary War. In fact, there was uh, in our town the George Washington Inn where George Washington slept. And, and my town was filled with revolutionary buildings and plaques, as, as were there on many of the towns um, on Long Island. And although I didn't like it at the time, my parents' idea of a vacation was to go antiquing through New England. And so gradually I grew to, to love things with history and um, felt that the East Coast had so much more of an appreciation and a respect for history than I found when I came to California. Um, because I had that love of history, we bought the um, house that, an adobe house, an old adobe house that was built in the 30s that was built by Marjorie Eaton, who lived and grew up in the Juana Briones house um, when she was a child. and. Um, so I, I just feel a real tie to the uh, Juana Briones house because my adobe house was built out of adobe because of Marjorie Eaton's love for the house in which she grew up. And you want to see it remain? I absolutely want to see it remain. There's nothing like it around. And we've seen our neighborhood change drastically. And this is something that we just, the community cannot afford to lose. An anchor. Definitely an anchor, a reminder. A reminder. We're here with Meredith Phillips at her wonderful home here on um, Old Adobe Road. And we're, of course, looking at the adobe behind us. Now, what does adobe mean, Meredith? I mean, I think I know, but I'm not quite sure my, my definition is the same as what it really is. Well, I guess there are several definitions. Uh, and in this case, it doesn't probably doesn't refer to adobe bricks that most people might think of. It actually refers to the adobe clay, the earth itself. And uh, the house originally apparently had walls of tamped earth that were in between wooden structures, which I think were called a crib or cribs. And that original earth from the 1840s is still there, apparently, in the core fragment of the house. OK. Now, you are a neighbor, uh, so to speak. So you've been able to look at this home. 
uh, and I know your view is changing, but you know, as a neighbor, how do you feel about the way the house has been neglected? Oh, well, I'm very saddened by it because um, from here, it's a beautiful view. The blues and greens of the house pick up the blues and greens of the hills and trees. As you get closer, uh, you see that it has been allowed to become very run down, uh, derelict even. And uh, it's just, I'm very sad that uh, an important fragment of history from when California was part of Mexico, this is being allowed to happen to it. Thank you. We're here with Hans Wolf in his uh, wonderful garden uh, with another view of the Juana Brionis uh, adobe in the background. And I wanted to ask you, Hans, uh, the, the house actually doesn't look like what I would consider an adobe. It looks more craftsman-like. Well, the wonderful thing about the Juana Brionis house is that it actually embodies two periods in California history. The three-room core dwelling was built in 1855 of rammed earth adobe construction. Then, about 1908, 1910, Professor Charles Knott, a biology professor at Stanford, added the second story and the two wings in craftsman style. Oh, so that's what we're looking that's at. That's what so we're I looking look now, but the old adobe is there. It's still there. Now, as a, wh why have you become involved uh, in, uh, in this process of trying to save the adobe? Well, Elizabeth and I moved here from New England, where everyone is very conscious of history. There are lots of old houses going back to the 1600s. Uh, we came to California not knowing that California also had a very rich history. And exactly. the Juana Brioni's, the Juana Brioni's house represents in a very important way that history, uh, the Rancho period, the Craftsman period. And it's the oldest house in Palo Alto by far. Uh, it's one of the few remaining adobe rammed earth construction houses in all of California. It would be a real shame to lose it. Uh, the citizens of California, particularly the school children, need to feel some tangible contact with their history. Exactly. Now, Hans, why do you, um, why are you involved with the foundation and exactly what do you do? Okay. <laughs> well, I went to a city council meeting at which Gail Woolley spoke about the Juana Briones House and I was captivated by the threat and the opportunity to do something to save it. And so I'm one of the founding members of the Juana Briones Heritage Foundation, one of its two vice presidents, and a financial donor. Oh, wonderful. Well, we want to thank you, Hans, and also Gail Woolley, uh, Meredith Phillips, and Diane Master for joining us in the Juana Briones neighborhood. And we also want to thank you, our viewers, for watching the Los Altos History Show. Please join us the next time.